Welcome to the Orca. Encana was once one of the largest and most influential energy companies in North America, proudly headquartered in Calgary, Alberta. Even the name Encana, shortened from the words Energy Canada, was meant to stoke national pride in our energy industry. The company was large enough to fend off American takeover attempts and flourish here, but the politicians pushed by anti-oil activists kept interfering, increasing taxes, adding red tape, and frankly stopping key projects. Now, when Canada has moved south of the border, investing billions of dollars in the United States and closing its Calgary head office. Now, Gwyn Morgan is the retired founding CEO of Encanta and recently wrote about these issues for the Orca. And Gwyn joins us now via telephone from Victoria. Gwyn, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, this really is um, a tale of two Trudeaus. Trudeau the Elder, Pierre Elliott, uh, he wanted to foster Canadian ownership and development of Canadian petroleum resources. And now it seems the sector is in turmoil, we'll say. And uh, because of intervention by or lack of intervention by the federal government of Trudeau the Younger. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, actually, it's not the, the tale of Trudeau isn't quite that way. The first Trudeau imposed the National Energy Program that almost killed the industry and almost killed our company. We managed to get through that. Um, and then as we grew the company uh, from where we started from scratch in 1975, we grew the company to become one of the largest, one of the two largest energy companies in Canada, the oil and gas companies. And uh, that was, so we survived the first Trudeau. We didn't think the second Trudeau could even be worse, but he, he turned out to be. But, but the other part of the story in my, uh, in, in my uh, little story I wrote about this for the newspaper was that um, uh, when, we, when we finally got to the point where we were one of the two largest companies in, in Canada and we wanted to uh, do a merger with the other largest oil and gas company, uh, we were, it was critical that when we announced that, that we, would be, we knew we'd be in play and some of the big uh, internationals were looking at us very seriously. So at that point, we managed to get uh, then uh, then um, Prime Minister um, Chrétien and his, his, his finance minister, Paul Martin, to come up with a statement saying that this th these two companies were very important and their merger would be a great thing for Canada. And that actually was critical to, to allowing us the 60 days we needed to get the merger done. I don't think we ever would have made it without them. So we have sort of three liberal governments. We have the Trudeau government, which was the first one, P Pierre one, Pierre uh, Trudeau one, which was a real disaster for the industry, not just us, but everybody in the industry. It was like in purgatory for four years. Um, and then uh, we had the Chrétien government, which actually helped us kept us from being picked off as we built the built the company into in Canada and then along came Trudeau too. So how would you say how would you grade the state of the petroleum industry then in Canada today? Well it's a it's it's, it's a sad shallow uh, shadow of itself but it's also in deep deep trouble I mean they if you can't market your product it's one thing not to be able to market your product, right? Uh, but it's another thing that the, part, the product that you are marketing is selling for 75% below the world price. And we're giving, the, we're giving away uh, uh, about $100 million a day to American refiners who buy our oil cheap, refine it, and sell it in the U.S. at world prices. So uh, there never has been in the history of this country ever such an amazing drain uh, of wealth going across the border and in the meantime you know 100,000 people plus out of work and it looks like it's going to get worse. Why have we allowed that to happen? How did it happen? Well you know I think when I think about it, so my, my little story about, about, about the, the Chrétien government <clears throat> There's a lot of things I could say about that government that I, I didn't like, but the one thing they believe, they knew was that energy industry and the oil and gas industry was their biggest export. It was their most important product project, their most important 
industry. It also was the fundamental underpinning of, of equalization across the country. And so they knew that. And, and when there was, if our companies had been taken out, they would have faced great criticism for ha having that happen. Um, so it, it, it's, it comes down to a kind of a question of philosophy and attitude. Uh, what's happened in the case of the, of the Trudeau two government here, Justin Trudeau, is that un fundamentally underlying the whole problem is a bias against fossil fuels. Uh, you know, this was the prime minister that came to Calgary not long after he was elected and said, we, 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 need, to fo we need to phase out fossil fuels, uh, but it'll be a longer term project. Well, as it turned out, because uh, he did everything possible to kill the pipelines that we needed to, to export well, the product. He's also the, he's uh, also the prime minister swears that Kinder Morgan will get built, yet we've seen nothing really, any movement on that sector for quite some time. Well, you know, he killed three pri pipelines first, right? And left himself in, in the corner with only one. And uh, it turned out to be a, a very problematic project in terms of uh, politically and legally. Uh, we have here we have uh, you know the, the energy east pipeline which is the most amazing story because uh, this was a pipeline that was already built it was a gas pipeline being converted to oil it was already built all they had to do is put oil pumps on in replacement for the gas compressors and it was going to come to go all the way to to quebec right. it was going to displace all those hundreds of saudi and Algerian and nigerian and venezuelan ships coming up the up the uh, st lawrence with canadian oil and then we're going to take the rest of that oil under the, under the water over to new brunswick and be able to export it internationally that project was a nation builder it was a no-brainer it would unite canada in terms of Canadian oil everywhere, remove all those ships out of the St. Lawrence, but they killed that project for one reason. And that reason was that Quebec was against it. And so after the Energy Board, National Energy Board, board hearings are over, basically, and it looked like the, they were about to issue their approval, the government decided to implement something called upstream emissions and, and uh, analysis, which means you look backward from the project, everything, to all of the emissions created by the, the production and transportation. We have but this they, landlocked resource in Alberta, uh, primarily in Alberta. They, they weren't the, the people, the Saudi Arabians who were producing oil, the Venezuelans, and all those tankers coming up the St. Lawrence were not subject to the same measure. So what that said to TransCanada, which is, was the proponent, that it's over. There's a bias, as I said earlier, a fundamental bias, and this was just a tool by which they could kill that project. And the same thing could be said about Northern Gateway to the Tidewater in the in the in, in the Northeast BC. Um, you know, it it goes on and on. So now they have a project that they own. They can't even get built because of their own regulations. Gwen, we, as I said, we've got all this landlocked resource in primarily Alberta and northern BC and whatnot. What happens if we can't get that Alberta crude to Tidewater? Well, what happens is what's happening right now. We, we, when you have a surplus of something, uh, the, the buyers can come and pay what they want. And right now they're paying uh, about 40 to $50 less a barrel. I mean, at $56 a barrel or $58 or whatever it is right now, in the U.S., we're getting about 13 to 15, and, and that's uh, about 100 million dollars a day, which is a billion dollars every two weeks. That's what that's what happens, and it's continuing to happen. And that's why I've just uh, published a, a piece in the in the media today, supporting production cuts because that's the only thing we can do to raise the price. So if we cut our production, which sounds counterintuitive to a lot of Canadians, we cut our production, perhaps even lose jobs in the, in the meantime, it's for, in the long run, it's for the good, the greater good of the country? We won't lose jobs, we'll gain jobs. Huge gain, because what will happen all of a sudden is the economics of the industry will make some sense. Right now, there's no, there's no point in investing in anything in, in Canada, in the oil side. Um, but in the but, short term, don't we lose jobs if we cut production right now? 
Well, we do, that's what we're trying to do is protect the jobs we have. See, the, the thing is that right now, virtually all investment investment by Canadian oil and gas companies, or most of it's going to the U.S., and the jobs are going there as well, because if you can't, if you can't sell your, your, your if you, there's no, no point in drilling a well or building an oil sands plant if you can't, if, if you can't get the oil out, and if you do get it out, it's way below cost. So the point of the whole point of a production cut is that you balance the amount of pipeline capacity with the amount of production. And as soon as you do that, then you're going to get the full price because there's no discount. You're, you're able to you're able to access all of the market without discounting, and it only takes about 10%. And so, for 10% of the of, uh, production cut, we're going to increase the price by 80%. That's a pretty good deal. And that like means jobs deal, coming yeah. back. And it means industry surviving. It means Alberta's economy surviving. It means a lot to the country. What do you make of the NDP Premier, Rachel Notley, uh, saying that she plans to buy tanker trains because this is a, a desperate move to get some of the oil to Tidewater somehow? Well, you know, she's talking about 200,000 barrels a day or something like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, and, and it'll take a year to get it. And right now, the, the reality is the industry cannot handle another year. You, people have no idea of the crisis that we're having. I mean, when you're having a uh, billion dollars of lost every two weeks, uh, that and and basically that it's not just that it's lost. It means it's being it's that the, the industry is not even paying its costs for the, for what it produces. Uh, that can't continue. This is what's now in. This is a this is an this is an economic crisis. It's an industry crisis. It's a crisis for employees. A crisis for the country, and we can't wait a year. Production cuts uh, of 10% uh, could restore the price to the world price within a few within a few weeks. And that's what we need to do. When as someone with a long career, a long and storied career in the Canadian petroleum sector, what does the future look like to you? Well. Um, I guess I can, you know, I could go into Great Depression about it because that's that would be very justified. Um, you know, Albertans, Western Canadians, are pretty resilient, and uh, uh, one way or another, we're going to have to get through this and get these pipelines built, and get, and in the meantime, we have to take actions on our own, which is what I'm talking about: production cuts to save the industry, and then at some point. Hopefully, we'll get a different government. But as long as we have a government that is fundamentally opposed to the fossil fuel industry, there's not a great future. You know, if you look at the cabinet, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, some of the cabinet members, if you look at the inner circle, uh, they actually were hired from the anti-fossil fuel environmental groups. Just look at the list. So when you have an attitude ensconced against the industry. Uh, they may, you know, buy a pipeline and try to get, that was a desperate move on their part because they knew the, the, the things got so bad they had to do something. And now we have a, a, we have a country with a reputation for by, by gained uh, very uh, logically by investors internally and externally that if, if you have a country that's a resource-based country, not just oil and gas, but mining, all the other resources, that the government of the country can't even get a project done that they own. Why would anyone else try? And we're going to leave it there, Gwen. Thank you so much for your time this morning. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.